Thanks, Matt. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Ian's book launch, uh, Disturbed Home, beautiful thing. Um, we had a chat about it before. We're going to keep it pretty free form. Mm -hmm. The plan, I think, is for Ian to give a bit of an intro to the book, its genesis, um, the thinking behind it, and talk about some of the projects and some of the photographs. And then we're going to have a little chat and we'll take some questions, so think of something to ask Ian, and we're going to keep it down to half an hour. Yep. So we can all go and have a drink after and sign some books. Yeah. Sound like a plan? That sounds like a plan. All take right. it away. Awesome. Thanks everyone for coming. I'm just going to drop back with a slideshow of stuff. So, I don't know if it wants to play. Let's see how it wants to go. How's that looking? Yeah, so the, um, the project started as sort of like a pre-COVID uh, project. So I think, I guess sort of by way of just sort of introducing my practice, I've been sort of working with the form of the home for about uh, sort of 10, 12 years before we started the process of creating this book. Um, and all of my projects, uh, to some degree, sort of interrogate the sort of domestic home, its form, but also the context of each neighborhood that we're invited to work. So they're really large scale collaborative projects working with big teams of people um, and importantly with the communities that they're a part of as well. Uh, and so the opportunity to exhibit the work so often just integrated with uh, the communities that they're in. So uh, often the works are shown just as individual bodies of work in the cities they're made and related back to those communities as well. So um, that has sort of been my experience of um, my practice for about 10, 12 years, as I said. Um, but around 2019, I started speaking with a curator, Kevin Moore, at Photo Focus Biennale out of Cincinnati, uh, and with Ian uh, Grandison at the Perth Festival as well, and at John Curtin Gallery, about starting to pull together a survey exhibition of these works, which is a really great opportunity to start to think about these um, individual projects that um, were made thinking about um, the individual communities and started to thread them together as a way of, um, uh, as a single body of work or consider them as a, a sort of survey of works created, um, created in kind of very different sites around the world. So I mean, it's everything from uh, Hearst earthquake, uh, Christchurch, New Zealand, to, you know, Detroit and Ohio and through the Rust Belt right after the GFC, um, right through into making works in my hometown of Perth, West Australia in 2015, right at the height of the mining boom there where the, you know, the land was worth more than the homes. And so um, it was a really wonderful opportunity to start to uh, pull this work together and working with my fabulous long-term collaborator and producer Jetta Andrews is here at the moment as well, to start to sort of lay these projects out uh, project by project, but then also start to consider their threads and their connections as a sort of larger body of work. And so um, that was working with the curators of both survey shows, a survey show for Cincinnati, for the Photo Focus Biennale, and also uh, working with John Curtin Gallery there as well. Um, and led to Kevin Moore writing a really beautiful uh, art, a sort of more traditional historic essay that sort of tracks the beginnings of my practice, sort of as a background in graffiti and street art and film and photography from Perth and getting to the US and tracking my practice kind of up to now. And Britt Savilson from, who's the photo curator at, uh, at LACMA, who then sort of wrote a more contemporaneous essay, sort of looking at uh, the practice uh, in relationship to the history of photography, particularly American photography um, and intervention practices, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, suburbia as well. So a really wonderful um, privilege to be able to have a book that sort of condenses this body of work we've been making, but also just kind of think about it in its totality as well. Um, and obviously the project happened um, during, sort of at the beginning and end of COVID as well. So there was um, a real opportunity to, um, I guess, reflect um, by force, I guess. We didn't really have a choice. So we got to spend a lot more time um, uh, and Baxter Bex Wilson, who did the design of the book, was really fabulous as well. He did this incredible design that we're working on here as well. And uh, Damiani, the, the publishers, who do both publishers and printers, did such an amazing job, having done a lot of um, photography books in the past as well. So a real privilege to, to reproduce them and, and colour proof them. Um, and I should say, working with my long-term printer, Joe Landro, who's based out of Perth as well, proofing everything. Um, so yeah, it sort of resulted in this book, which then launched and unlaunched and sort of came out at the beginning of COVID. And um, I think we tried to do something about six months ago. And so 
um, it's really wonderful to sort of be back here and able to actually finally uh, launch it here in Australia. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. Um, well, congrats on the book. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and the work is, yeah, I mean, you can see it on the screen. Uh, maybe we can start by, you mentioned the housing crisis. I'm really interested in your, like, um, where you see the home or how it, what is a home, your relationship to a home and perhaps how it has changed or become um, yeah. complex? Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think um, there's two things, I guess, related to that. So the housing crisis, I think the, probably the important thing to know is this work was sort of gestated and started to make once I'd moved to the US mm. in 2009, 2010, which is obviously right at the um, beginning of, or the start of the, yeah. the global financial crisis, which really, um, for me, in terms of globally, I think really kind of situates the work in this, I think it's kind of like uh, the definitive kind of bookend to some sort of post-war utopic notion of mm. home ownership mm. and accessibility mm. as well around the world. So I think um, in terms of conceptually thinking about the suburban home, I think a lot of people have made work about suburbia that um, up until that point, they really looked at the mundane the accessible of it, the kind of broad middle classes as well. And I think this body of work sort of coincidentally starts at this beginning of the sort of unpicking of that accessibility and that sort of uh, utopic notion of home and a sort of younger generation that's sort of been more dislocated from the notion of home ownership and suburbia mm -hmm. or ways of living that may be traditional. So that's the sort of larger social context. And for me personally, I you know grew up in you know, the suburban suburbs Perth. of suburban Perth. And I was a, you know, um, probably uh, angsty graffiti writer and you know, wanted to make films. And so I think, you know, for me coming from, from Perth and this very early internet, I think I felt a real sense of needing to like escape and go out into the world and probably a little bit of, um, yeah, that kind of typical suburban angst of that age. So that sort of really inform informed my kind of early relationship to those spaces. And then obviously then, having a career in graffiti and street art and moving to the US as well that then sort of led to I think is is more in this work than I would like to think it is but it really is still, yeah, yeah, still yeah. in there a lot yeah right so I mean those two responses in a way sort of overlap don't they <laughs> like a um I mean, if I understand it as, as this sense that the home, which was once this kind of symbol of security for, for some, for those who can get into it, um, becomes this thing which is dragging you down. It becomes this sort of symbol of actually the, of the crisis and the crash and the personal costs to that. And then you growing up in Perth as a graffiti writer, like, yeah. um, you know, kicking against that context, kicking against that... Um, you know, the constraints of, of, of suburbia and its monotony and needing to, I don't know, go to New York, like yep. um, reinvent yourself, get out of there. Yes. Yeah. And it still becomes the subject of your work though. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. And I think yeah. it was, it's not, I think the nice thing about a book like this is it can make everything seem really deliberate and concise and considered, but the reality is it was like, you know, the, the first projects that we made working with the home were not something that I wouldn't have said I'd be making this for 12 years. It's something yeah, that led yeah. to the next uh, idea, the next interrogation, the next opportunity as well. And so it really <coughs> grew into being this body of work that kind of started as a, I guess, personal investigation and personal interest to something that is very much become more informed about communities and then the mm. kind of privilege of being invited into communities to really understand their circumstances and somehow create a project that becomes a vessel for communication and collaboration mm, mm. within that community as well, which is really, um, I guess, kind of the opposite of being a graffiti artist, like painting on something without permission, yeah, and yeah, working yeah. for months and then working with the community to gain trust and permission to still paint on a house, I guess. Um, I, I want to get to communities. I first of all want to talk about your, let's say the specific nature of your interventions yeah um some of them are circles like so almost targets mm -hmm. some of them are crosses some yep. of them are like a monotone flat That's black yeah uh treatment of all of the all the detail and surface gets um painted away tell us about your decisions when you make those interventions what, what are you tr trying to turn the home into or what are you trying to encourage people to look at yeah. yeah, I think I think all of them. I think essentially for across the entire practice, my interest is really like twofold. One is somehow taking a psychological interior of the home 
and then sort of placing it onto its exterior as well and somehow kind of poetically communicate either the circumstances or the situation of the house or the um, kind of emotional interior of those spaces. Um, and then there's also the functional thing of an intervention as well. So by crossing out or marking a house, there's this sense of, um, I guess, aesthetic attack or destruction as well, which I'm really interested in and um, have always been really interested in the sort of long lineage of human markings directly on homes, whether that's emergency markings, graffiti, protective symbols um, that are often used against the home and how it sort of can become a, a billboard for the, the circumstances of the house, whether that's something to do with the community, the economy, or a sort of psychological interior, or the um, belief systems of the people inside the house as well. Um, and so that act of marking, I think, is something that is really, um, I mean, even coming from a graffiti background, like seeing marking on a civic building versus a marking on someone's domestic home somehow feels more personal as well, mm. as sort of a sacred place to be marked as well. And I think that I'm really interested in that, that sort of tension, that immediacy of seeing the marked home. Um, and then functionally, things like painting a house entirely black um, for the shadow series is a way of compressing all the features of the home so you consider it in its totality as a single object or a single entity and, and thinking about it as, as one object and then also within that series painting it black sort of allows this sort of imaginary erasure of the home sort of a disappearing mm. of it or um, sort of imagining it outside of that landscape as well um, and sort of almost you know cutting it out as well yeah, the landscape. Yeah. Well, um uh, I've seen you describe your process before and one of the things that really struck me about it is that when you come to these homes you fix them up mm -hmm. before you paint them yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which really surprised me because you know often you imagine these homes which are you know um, falling over and that's why you've got the opportunity to work yes. with them but actually you you repair them to make them sort of restore them before you then yep. attack them with your paint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think that uh, the important part of that is I think it's because I'm really not interested in making work about ruins specifically. Yeah. So it's really about restoring the home back to its imagined self or its an idealised self. And I think, you know, um, particularly as an outsider coming into communities many times, obviously it, at the invitation of communities as well, but there's a sensitivity not to be exploitative about the conditions of homes and areas there. And I also think if you do see a dilapidated or destroyed home, it, it, it becomes very specific to an area or a circumstance. But if you see a home that is, seems loved and cared for and it's idealised off, and then that then is marked. It's reacting against its sort of, I guess, idealised economic self, imagine self, a place of safety and security. And I think a, a sort of dilapidated home doesn't speak to a sense of, um, of safety mm. at all, mm. and so then those, I guess, those markings or those interventions on the house will have less, less contrast or rub. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. not, it's not playing yeah. against the idea, and I think that if the work for me is successful, it's either, it's simultaneously has resonance to the circumstances of the community that it's made in, but then it's also able to be seen in uh, other cities or on, on gallery walls without knowing anything about the context of that neighbourhood, and it's just a response to the kind of symbol or icon. Of the, of the home itself, so people are able to bring their own, um, I guess, um, psychological reaction to the work as well, their kind of in, internalised notion of home or place or memory connected to the image of the home. Um, okay, we're coming back to the, yep. the point about communities now. Um, and you've mentioned it a few times, it's obviously really important now to this set of projects. Um, so yeah, perhaps you can talk about what that um, engagement looks like yeah. How long are you spending in those cities? Who, who are you working with? Um, how are you revealing their stories and so on? Yeah, yeah. I look, it's, I, I should be really clear, it's a super, it's a growing thing as well. Mm -hmm. So it's been something that has evolved over time as sort of, um, I guess, as a sort of social practice as well. And so um, more often than not, um, at the beginning, we would sort of seek out community groups to work with, but now more often than not, there's an invitation from a festival or a yeah. community um, that are sort of aware of the work that we make. Um, and then the, the, for the first step is just sort of beginning a sort of conversation, early research into the area and the community, um, and then a sort of a site visit. And I think the, the most important thing is that invitation and an understanding that the work would be welcomed, yeah. not just by a festival, but by the communities that we want to work in. Um, and so that starts a sort of research period um, and conversations with locals and developing up sort of, I guess, what those stakeholder relationships are there, which are generally where we can. There's partnerships with 
universities, so there's sort of student involvements in the projects. And um, uh, you know, the most recent project in Cincinnati was through a, a paid uh, internship project with the art students there. Um, and then meeting like local community groups, museums, research centres, and mm. then sort of starting to f pull out kind of what the narratives are and what, and what the sites may, we may have access to and, and what that response could be as well. And sometimes it's completely obvious what the work is, and other times it really is a, a deep yeah, sort of right. That's process. interesting. Right. So the work, the form of the work evolves through that yes. process. Yes. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Um, and in a way, does it also give create two sides of the work? Because I imagine the early work was very much um, what sticks to the lens, what sticks yep. to the photo, yep. becomes the, the the work, and the house is the sort of. Um, I don't know, backdrop to it. But now yeah. you've got these two scales, don't you? The, the work hanging in the gallery and the, and the house in the street, in the community, in the community yeah. with the people around it. So yeah. How, yeah, how do you operate on those two different scales then? Um, it's, it's always case by case and it's, there's a really an inherent contradiction because I think seeing a photograph of a house in the wall, on the wall of like a museum speaks to kind of, I guess, the history of photography and the history of people right. interrogating it brings suburbia. The whole, There's the weight uh, of the museum. Baggage of etiquette and expectation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. it speaks to, you know, the lineage of other artists who've created interventions with architecture and homes. Mm. And sort of so someone who might be, you know, a museum going sort of someone who's had a background in, in art or architecture would read that work formally on a wall very differently mm. to obviously a community where, you know, the first point of call is us kind of knocking on their door showing them a flyer about the work, getting permission, and their, their relationship to the work is their deep knowledge of that street, that home, that mm. community, the circumstances of those areas as well. And so um, I guess there's those sort of really dual, unique, but not, um, I guess I wouldn't give one primacy over the other. I think they're both sort of uh, important experiences of the work. It's one for the community itself in that area, um, and then one which is I guess can kind of sit in a more formal space in a gallery and I guess there's sort of this washing between mm. the two mm. and a kind of, um, you know, the information's in a museum that will tell you the context of that work, but obviously you're not going to have the same experience as someone who's lived in the neighbourhood and understood it or gone through the process of making the work mm. with us in collaboration. Um, uh, I wanted to ask about your influences. I mean, there's a great set of photos in the um, and references in, in the front of this in the first essay. Um, Burden Hiller Becker, the um, uh, Gordon Matter Clark, mm -hmm. um, artists who are interfacing directly either to arch with architecture, either through photography or through um, installation and cutting. And, and a lot of these actions come from well, can, can be found in some of these other other artists. How, where do you see your, how do you, how are you climbing on top of these great These giants, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what do you, how do you see your work, um, you know, is it a, is it that, is that the spectre that hangs over you or is it something that you, as I say, climb on top of? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think the big one is like Matter Clark, which sort yeah, of like yeah, looms yeah. over everything. Um, I thought that was like worship. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, is, that is worship, <laughs> yeah. And I think, so, um, there's those practices and uh, John DeVola and um, Richard, uh, Richard Wilson and artists who've worked with interventions directly onto architecture and there's also the history of photography as well that leads into it. So I think there's, I see these sort of dual um, histories of architectural intervention and site-based works and aspects of social practice as well, working in communities and artists who look at suburbia and the suburban and the, the archetypal home and then there's this sort of uh, lineage of photography as well, which is a big part of the process. And I should say that, you know, if you look at a, you know, Devola work or a Matter Clark work, that work is documented and the documentation is very, you know, in made in the, the late 70s, early 80s, it was colour photography, but they're shot in black and white, yeah. very formally, like kind of in really interesting ways documented, but it's documented as a, as a kind of raw documentation. It's like, um, there's sort of an anti-aesthetic to mm. it or a really paired back aesthetic to it. So for me, I, w I really like using photography as a way of speaking to the home through the lens of, it was understood through media, through photography, through, you know, film. And so I like using all those sort of tropes of um, film and television. So you're also not speaking just to the intervention directly onto the architecture itself, but also the lens with which it was sort of broadcast as a notion or idea through time as well. So I like the idea of 
working between those two spaces. So I would say that is certainly a point of difference for me um, with those artists, but it's certainly, it's certainly in dialogue and in many cases I've made works which are completely direct references and homages to, to works of those artists as well mm -hmm. in the past. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I'm conscious of the time and it's hot, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and like a lot of people are standing up. So uh, I, I hope it's not too rude if we, if we no, take sorry. a few questions and then have a drink and, and like open drink. the door and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So who's got any questions for Ian? Up the back. Um, I found it interesting that you didn't speak at all on your influences about DIY because I think like as an artist you're like practice and just your behaviour is going to be better than your kind of DIY, DIY. community. Yeah. Um, and also like that is kind of also who your community is, not only as an independent artist, but just as a person who connects yeah. with other people who take that approach to things. I thought maybe it would be interesting if you could sort of define what that really is and like talk a bit about the role that it plays in your work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think the um, <laughs> the I think definitely coming from a graffiti background is really a kind of or they say like throw, throw your bag over the fence kind of thing where you overcommit and then jump over and then do the thing as well. And so <laughs> I like it. It's, and I really like it. And that's like comes from a community of people that there was no real, you know, obviously I'm in Melbourne, I need to explain what graffiti and street art is to people here. But it's a really DIY yeah, we've got community. Hosea Lane. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, I think that community of people who made work, particularly back then, without any knowledge of where that um, where it would go, that there was an industry for it. Um, and I think very much, you know, friends who are musicians and it was sort of like making, making the work you wanted to make. And I, you know, studied film as well and was really influenced by early uh, indie filmmakers. And so the idea of like independent cinema and, you know, starting to make this work was around the time that digital cinema cameras started to become accessible, which kind of meant that, you know, you could start shooting at, you know, 4K and these big, like, and work at this level that was like not, not possible for independent artists a long time ago. And we'll get this really high aesthetic level. I was always really inspired by Matt Barney's film work, which obviously oh, yeah. cost like, you know, millions of dollars to make and shot on 35 and then, you know, come along, you know, 2011, 2012 and red cameras come out and you can suddenly shoot at this level and grade at this level and create, you know, speak to a cinema history really directly, aesthetically as well, which I think I really love. And if I, Okay. I was, can I? Yeah, of course. Butt yeah. in. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> At what point, though, does it does it do you make the jump? You know, it, where's the link back to? Where, at what point do you say, okay, I'm no longer DIY. I'm no longer graffiti. I'm an artist. I'm showing in museums, and I'm and that's where right. I'm. And I don't just mean the invitations. I mean your. Did, was there a conscious moment where you reframed the work, uh, rather than being the underdog to being the like? you know making things which are grand and formal that's yeah. so i don't think i would think of myself <laughs> like that honestly yeah there's no no i'm but i'm yeah. with you I've, yeah. I've, uh, uh, an artist friend uh, tv moore said to me once always leave gum in the corner which is, is to say <laughs> there are people who make nike commercials there's people who make these big super bowl ads and they have all the money in the world you don't want to make that. You want to make something that shows the texture, mm. that shows the imperfection, that shows you're actually an artist in that space, which is like, that can be camera shakes, that can be all these things, but it's not about needing to make something that's completely polished. It's actually the thing that you make because of the nature of, you know, we're still on, you know, I mean, Jed is here, we're still on limited budgets. We're still <laughs> like, we're like making things that look like, you know, I, yeah, I, I, I would, they, they they definitely, I probably should say this too publicly, but they definitely, uh, we, they can look like they cost three times as much as they cost to make mm -hmm. because, um, because of the ingenuity of the collaborators I always have and they're constantly working with um, and really um, smart people, but also, you know, trading on the goodwill of communities there as well who get behind these projects. And I think a lot of the time it starts at this scale and it becomes, um, at the studio we talk about making stone soup. So the story of stone soup is on at the end of the, I don't know, the fable, it's on walks along, yeah, yeah, yeah. it says I'm making stone soup. So what's in stone soup? It's like, oh, it's delicious, should have it. But what we really need is some carrots. So someone comes along and says, oh, I can get some carrots. And it goes along and eventually there's all these animals in the forest eating this stone soup and loving stone soup. But really all you do as an artist is start with an idea 
and you're kind of making stone soup and the people come, yeah. they <laughs> believe in the vision for it and they contribute and end up making something that is wholly greater because of the people who are a yeah. part of it and the community that's a part of it mm -hmm. than you could have really imagined in a studio or a sketchbook as well. And so that's, I mean, that's still very a DIY. Yeah. idea yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah. manifest as a kind of social practice in a community mm -hmm. okay, we can go. well played okay <laughs> <laughs> yep up the back hi you talked a little bit about the uh, initial stakeholder engagement and working with the community yep and maybe a, a bit of a tricky question to ask but can you talk to a little bit more about the reaction from the community yep the work has done just in the trees in terms of yeah how long it lasts and the initial sort of impact that had yeah, and um, it's something that we're always sort of reassessing um, at the studio and how we work and, and the people that we work with as well. Um, we've never really had a negative reaction and, you know, but I, to be really honest, there's been communities where we've done initial research and outreach and really just talked to everyone and felt like now's not the right time for a project or there isn't really the space to make the work there. So we're always really sensitive to the idea that maybe the timing's off and maybe it's something that we revisit revisit later um, but for the most part the I think being outside of Australian someone with an Australian accent turning up in a, in a <laughs> neighborhood and then showing the good thing is having work in the past showing work that we've made in the past I think there's just this sort of you know this sort of oddity curiosity in the neighborhood and then we're there for a while like fixing up the houses and you know, like the people we haven't met through introduction you kind of bump into them and the first introduction is generally us kind of fixing an old house in their neighborhood and doing it up um, and so there's this sort of active care to the home and an active care for a neighborhood as well which opens up conversations so sometimes the final images can actually seem very you know arresting but a lot of the time those interventions are, are very short term they're either there for um, you know, a few days because the house is scheduled for demolition or in some cases works in Detroit. We worked with land banks and organisations where they were tempor temporary interventions that were then removed off the house and they will continue to be restored. And then there's, you know, I mean, there's families, the Red X house, I don't know if you've seen that one, wherever it went, but the, you know, there's, there's families that live in that home now as well after we restored it, which created kind of value in the community after the fact. Um, and sort of more and more we're trying to work with stories where it's more focused on what is the story of those neighbourhoods and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's generally positive and um, if not just sort of mildly bemused at what this <laughs> artist is doing in their neighbourhood and with communities. And if you work with students as well, people love being able to support student projects as well, so it's a big part of it. Yes. We'll take one last quick one and then we'll... Sorry. No, no. <laughs> Go. Order of the creative process, yep. as in, is it linear? Do you work a specific way, or is it case by case? In so, are you starting with I'm looking for a particular story, or I'm looking for a particular style of house, or I'm really obsessed with this idea of doing a red dot on a house, right? Where, or is it you know you find a story, then it's like okay, this one, yeah, something really dark about this one, so it has to be black, right? Right, right, um. It, being really honest, at the start, there was, I had kind of more aesthetic ideas of what I wanted to apply to house. The first American series was really like, what are these formal painted interventions directly on homes that look and feel like uh, sort of utopic American suburban homes of a certain era that were also starting to fall into decline after 2008. So that sort of started there and there was a level of community consultation there, but those homes are being demolished so fast that we worked at a really high volume, but since that project, it really has been more about what is that community need. Um, and I think the big transition, for sort of us as a studio when collaborating, is was going to Christchurch, New Zealand after the earthquake, and that was somewhere where, you know, going in there and meeting with everyone, there's absolutely no way I was going to go paint big red X's over houses. You know, half the film industry there was deeply, if personally affected, through deaths within that industry. Like so, there was such a it was years after the two, three years after the quake as well. So it was really about meeting with the community there, meeting with the neighbours of the street and that people and, and restoring those homes. And then through that, it was like, okay, it was something to do with light, something to do with cutting. And then it was, um, it was really about responding to that. And I think after having that experience in a community, making that work and then re-showing it back to that community and seeing that response, that really was the sort of tipping point of saying, okay, it actually comes from the stories on the ground. It's a, really big shift. It's a massive shift. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, we, that started to happen while we're working in the US as well, and sort of 
embedding in neighborhoods to make the work, but I, I, I can honestly say it didn't start with a social practice focus at the beginning. It started really with a aesthetic concerns, and then it is very much switched, switched, swapped the, completely the other way, where it really starts from a, a community-led direction to the work as well. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> Disturbed Home, Ian Strange, books for sale out there. There's photos, essays, it's got hardcover. It's got, <laughs> um, books for sale at the front, guys, and if you ask nicely. Oh, up front, the front, yeah. yeah. Front. yeah. I'm Good. sure Ian will be, will be happy to, to sign it, hopefully. Absolutely, of course. Um, thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. coming. Awesome, thank you so much for coming. Yeah. <laughs>